Thanks a lot uh, to Sok. First of all, I like to thank the organizer for inviting me for this to this uh, very beautiful place and very nice and interesting workshop. Um, at the beginning, I'd like to emphasize that uh, the work I'm showing here is done by a scientist in our group, Martin Siegler, PhD students, Mirko Hansen, Marina Ignatov, Adrian Petrauer, and we are, have a cooperation with the University of Bochum for this uh, talk here. This is from Sven Dirkmann and Thomas Musselbrock. Actually, this was a very nice introductory talk from Philip Wong, and uh, I noticed the second slide, there was Barack Obama on, the one, uh, I think, the most powerful man in the world, and uh, of course, I cannot compete with this person, but I have another one here, which is also famous, <laughs> and uh, also coming from the, from the US. And um, actually, actually, what um, the message is here the same, like Philip Wong said, because you have a brain, that one from Homer Simpson, this case, and we had a small exercise at the beginning of our lectures for neuromorphic engineering, simply by putting a professor chips, a processor chips 50 watt per ship, in the brain of a cube of 1,000 cubic centimeter. And when you are doing that, and you claim you have around 10 billion devices, that's a bit larger than the actual integration density, but sooner or later the industry will reach that, you come up with uh, 20,000 chips in the brain from Homer Simpson, and when you count the numbers of transistors, it's approximately the same numbers, 10 to, uh, 10, uh, 2 times 10 to the four, uh, power of 14 synapses in the brain. So that's rather similar. On the other hand, when you, when you claim that all uh, processors working simultaneously with 50 watt, you end up, when you're doing something like that, with one megawatt. So the message is the same like, like in the previous talk. When you compare it to the, to the brain, you have something like 25, 20, 25 watt. So this already means also this is very simple and maybe you can argue a lot about that. This gives some hint that the architecture in digital computing and the new mode system is totally different. And uh, in the beginning I will say some words about that. Actually we were doing some experiments whether the 25 watt depend on the DAF content. This is not clear now. Okay, um, when you scale it down to the MOSFET, you have five nanowatts here on that side and you have only 250 watt femtowatt on the other side. Uh, a bit more serious. Uh, bi biological system, maybe you can define a system far from equilibrium. When your system is in equilibrium, you're simply dead. So you're far away from uh, equilibrium and you are in a permanent interaction with the, with the environment. And so you need a nervous system which always, all the time, permanently reacts on the environment and gives sometimes some useful reactions. So the question here is, when you compare it with digital computers, it's totally different. You have data input, light, sound, smell, or whatever, and there are a lot of interesting, challenging questions out there. How, for example, the human brain makes a three-dimensional representation of this room. This is not really understood. And when you try to build neuromorphic system, Sooner or later, I think you have to understand to build the right systems. Okay. Um, what about the, the signals? So Philip Bowen talked about spikes and spike-dependent plasticity. Here I took something from a textbook, a neuron which, of course, there are different neurons in, in, in your brain, but more or less the building blocks are the same. So you have some kind of, uh, sorry, some kind of input, you have a soma here, you have a trigger zone, something like a comparator, and then you have a transmission line, synaptic ends, and so on, and we have the next um, synaptic. This is the signal pathway here, and already you see the most important ingredients. So that's the input signal, some potential here, and when you reach a certain, certain value here, you get again this potential, but in addition, the spikes. And all this information in the brain, in this three-dimensional system, is more or less in these kind of spikes, and they are not regular. There are a lot of information because these signals are stochastic. This you have to take into account. When you increase the, the signal here in the input, then you get more spikes. So you have some kind of coding. In dependency of the signal input, the output reacts in a different way, so you get more or less signals here, different frequencies here, in dependency on the input. So that's some ingredients of, of this kind of biological system, which you have to take into account when you like to build a new market system. More closely, so what we do need when we try to build neuromorphic system, we need something like a synapse, a connection between the neurons, which are of course not constant. So your whole brain learns because you have an adaptive system. 
the, the strength of these connections independently of the input signal uh, will react and will change, so permanently change. And therefore, um, when you like to mimic, you need some kind of device, which is of course a memory sniff device in our case. The action potential, um, this is the input potential, this is the output potential here, and Philip Tong, uh, Wong uh, talked already about spite-dependent plasticity, so I can, can skip that. A few words again about, a few numbers about biological uh, system and when you compare it to digital computers. It's very rough. What you see from the point of numbers, these spikes are always the same in height, around 100 millivolt in the brain. The duration, the length, or the, the time length of this, this uh, spike is around 3.5 milliseconds. And the speed along this axon line, this transmission line, is in dependency of the creature you have, something between 0 0.1 meter per second to 100 meter per second. That's the maximum you can get. When you compare these numbers in a very rough and simple way with your digital computer, with your aromatic logic unit, you are far orders away from that. So your ALU has typically 10 nanoseconds, 20 nanoseconds for the pulse. You have a speed nearly to the speed of light on your, on your system. So this also means that the architecture and biological system is completely different you know, because they use very slow system, very long time pulses when you compare it to the computer. But for many applications, this parallelism, this three-dimensional structure helps you to solve recognition problems, pattern recognition. It's much more efficient. This is one of the most important parts. Again, we are looking to the, to the neuron. So the numbers you, you saw already, we have around 10 to the 11 neurons in the brain, 10 to the 3 or 10 to the 4 synapses. So it's a, it's a 10 to the fourth, uh, power of 14 interconnections. We have. It's a very huge network. And uh, in addition, it's not randomly coupled. You have a lot of topology inside, which you know from, from kind of MRT um, observations. So you have to go to the incredence of the local um, synaptic interconnections, but you have also to understand the global network to build a new system. Oops. Okay, and uh, the idea is rather intuitive and straightforward. So when the synaptic connection is strengthened or weakened, and this means learning, then the question is which kind of device you might use to mimic that. In uh, the last couple of years, uh, this memory stiff device came up with, um, with the theory of Leo Chua and uh, realized by the Bell Labs. And we have a memory stiff device, and that means in the simple terms, you have a voltage here, a current here, and when you apply the voltage, you get come to another state with a memory inside, and of course, you can build digital switches, but you can also build devices in an analog way. I will show that later. So that's the basic um, building block for our system. So it's a memory stiff device. Unfortunately, it's not locally the memory stiff device, but you have to take it into account the system level. And what I show here in the top is in neurobiology. You go from synaptic clefts here, which are 20 nanometer part. You go to the neuron, the single processing unit, but then you have to connect the neurons to global networks. And what I show here is the hippocampus. That's a part in your brain which is very important for pattern recognition. It's very important to transfer short-term memory to long-term memory. So that's what is deep inside your brain. And actually in our research group, we are trying to mimic part of the circuit of the hippocampus because it's so important for pattern recognition and pattern separation. On the other side, you see here the electronic device. So the synapses will be mimicked by the membranous device. Then we make small circuits. I will show that today to mimic part of the biology. We will see that. And then later on, we go to recurrent networks and bio-inspired networks from the hippocampus. That's the aim. That's, it. That's the aim we like to go. So today I will talk about the device and also go a step forward to small circuits, not the whole brain. Well, actually not possible for us. So here, a few demonstrations over the last years. So we became interesting to, to, to show some kind of basic behavior, what is called conditioning in behaviorism. And I think it's a very famous experiment more than 100 years ago from Ivan Pavlov. That's Pavlov's dog. 
and you can condition the dog by using the food and the bell, and when you do it uh, simultaneously, the dog will learn even to salivate when the bell rings on a lot. Now, this is a famous experiment. So we did that in an electronic way by using a memristor, and this was soon later done by a French group as well. So this is one example we are going for. So we are building relatively small circuits which are related to biology. That's the Next one. There was a nice work from Persian Deventra some years ago. They write down a differential equation for a very simple, uh, simple system. That's an amoeba. That's a unicellular system. So far away from 10 to the power of 14 neurons. It's just one um, cell. And they write down a um, differential equation. They use this differential equation to, to put that in a circuit here and to simulate that. And actually, we realized in a bit different way this circuit. And what you can show is that this kind of amoeba, like in biology, learns, anticipates, and that's possible, this kind of learning and anticipation of this single unit cell or cell to transfer that to an electronic circuit. So that's possible. Of course, this is much more modest and much more uh, smaller steps than to mimic the whole brain with a new morphic circuit. So the uh, talk will be divided in two parts. The first part will be yeah, on vanadium oxide, which I learned this is a material of interest here in the audience. And we built a small circuit out of that, neuromorphic circuit for the so-called firing rate adaptation, which is an important ingredient in biology. And another one is more related to the device physics. So we built up a membristive tunnel junction, which is forming free. And I will start with part one and then go over to the device. When you go back nearly 100 years, there's one famous experiment that's called frequency adaptation. This was discovered by Edgar Adrian, and he did the following biological experiment. He used some kind of pork muscle, and he used the instrument of torture. And you can imagine when you turn the knob here, you have some talk here, some talk here, and then you heard the fork. Actually, what is very interesting in this kind of work is that he was able, that time already, to measure the spikes, what I showed before, 100 millivolt in amplitude, 3.5 milliseconds in duration. The most important outcome of that work is the firing rate hypothesis. That means when you have a constant stimulus, so the pressure might be constant here, and then you measure the, the pulsing of the spiking, then the system reacts, the biological system, first it goes up in the number of cycles, and then with time it reduces and stays constant. This is shown here. So this is a very important principle in biology, this kind of frequency adaptation. And nowadays it's known it's not only happened at the sensory input, it's also happened in your brain. And I think we all know that. When you have something new, you get interested in it, and then when later on it becomes boring. That's the same message here in principle. Well, it's a very, principle, very fundamental principle. And that's what we are trying to do now, to take fundamental principles from biology and make a circuit out of that. We'll try that. Okay. This is what uh, my colleagues have done, Martin Siegler and the PhD students. So they built up a neuron. So they have the dendrites here, the input, by the way, in neuromorphic um, inform neuroinformatics, this is called the perceptron in principle. No? It's the same thing. Then you have the soma, the processing unit, and the output here, the axon, which fires or not. This is more or less a leaky integrated firing circuit. So what we have included is a current source here, vanadium oxide. When you remember the talk from Ivan Schiller, this is a um, device with a negative differential resistance, so you can build up a relax relaxation oscillator. You have a capacitor here, and you have some output circuits. Very, in principle, very simple. So how these systems function, or what comes out? First of all, I'd like to emphasize our work on vanadium oxide. At the moment, I have no time to talk about that. If you'd like to have more data on that, we can do it in a discussion. So I would be happy if someone asked about vanadium oxide. But what you see here, the circuit is a negative differential resistance. Actually, this was measured as a lateral device. This was measured as a current source you can go the whole cycle through because the current source was used, not the voltage source. And what you see here is rather similar to that, what Adrian that time observed in the biological uh, um, um, uh, experiment. 
So this is shown here again. You have different stimulus. That means more or less the pressure of the needle or the fork. And then the firing rate. So when the stimulus is too low, the system will not react. If you get to a higher stimulus, higher pressure with the needle, then um, you get two spikes here. When you increase the pressure further, you get many spikes. But already here you see, in the beginning, you have high frequency and then it's lowered down. This is already some kind of adaptation. You know? It starts with a high frequency and then it relaxes in frequency. So what is the, about our circuit? So this is the stimulus. The stimulus is, of course, not a needle. This is a current, a constant current we put in. There's no reaction in the beginning, like here. Then we increase the stimulus. We get a certain firing rate and then increase the st a stimulus further. Then we get a higher firing rate. So the, our system reacts rather similar to a biological system from the input point of input signals. This is frequency coding. So what we do not have yet included here is this kind of adaptation here. And then we went to the, back, to the work of Diventra in Pershing and we included some kind of MEM capacitance device. So a capacitance reacts, uh, which react on the, on, the, on the charge which is flowing from, from, through the outside to the device. And when you do, when you increase, when you put in such a device here, the outcome is the following. So just remember the, the experiment from, from Adrian with a needle here and the fre frequency adaptation. Exactly the same is now happened here. You increase the current, you keep the, uh, the current constant, and after a while, when this mem capacitive device reacts, you change the frequency, and that means you have a frequency adaptation. So that's also rather similar to a biological instrument with a few numbers of, of devices, and you can mimic rather important parts of the biological system. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to the following point. In this kind of device here, in this kind of capacitive divider here, we used a more digital device, what Philip Wong has also shown as well, which is very nice for for uh, random access memories, actually. But maybe it's, it's, it's more a digital device, and what we like to have is more an analog device. So this is uh, the IV curve. That's aluminum, titanium oxide, silver. Then you measure the IV curve with a compliance here. We saw that just an hour ago. And here's a reset, and you have a really a digital pulse. Here. This means, in our circuit, that we do not have a smooth adaptation, like in biology, we have a rather strong jump in the frequency due to this digital behavior of the device. We, can, we like to get rid of that. We like to have a more analog device at that point. And that's the reason I come in, uh, to the next part of the talk, so to build an analog device. Actually, um, Thomas Musenbrock and Sven Dirkman, Martin Ziegler, they, they looked also a bit deeper inside in these, this kind of device. Why we get such a um, uh, IV characteristic, a digital one, so it's a bit different material, um, uh, layer sequence, but nevertheless, it's in, the principles are the same. Like in the previous talk, it, uh, they use the kinetic uh, Monte Carlo simulations, and hopefully I can show the movie. Should be at least one movie in a talk, no? Okay. So what you see here, what they, what they did is uh, you have the two electrodes, the, the red ones are the ions, and what you see on the, on the left-hand side um, is the red curve is the current, and the blue one is the voltage controlled by the current source. And uh, exactly what, what, is, what was claimed in the previous talk, you see this building, this growing of the filaments, and this is, of course, the distance of these filaments are related to their V characteristic. So that means when you have a filamentary device, you more or less get something like, an, like a digital behavior because you grow the filament and suddenly the current increases and you get a digital one which is nice for RAM application but maybe not so nice when you would like to do an analog computer. Yes, that's right. So if you run again your car, will you get the same response or your memory will be in some other set state and then the 
that depends how, how in which state the memristor goes. When it's a permanent state, then of course you will go back, uh, you will stay there. If it, the memristor goes back, you go to the beginning again. So yes, 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 right. But when you have an analog device, it might be a different story. Okay, the conclusion of the first part is realization of a member-stiff neuron circuit. That's a frequency adaptation. We use vanadium oxide to get the frequency coding and the mem capacitance to implement the frequency adaptation. Second part. So what we like to go, we go away from these filament uh, devices and we try to engineer actually an homogeneous device. Uh, so an area-based device where you do not build in filament, you do not like to have a forming step, you like to move an interface inside your system uh, simultaneously to one or another electrodes and therefore change the resistance of the device. So the advantage of such area-based devices or homogeneous devices are non-electroforming. So in other devices you need forming when you have a complex circuit. It's very difficult to get the right forming voltage in each of these devices, uh, especially when you have wire resistance and something like that. Uh, the on resistance scales with area, we will see that, and most probably we have a higher run-to-run reproducibility of the, of the device. Let's go for that. So what we like to have for neuromorphic engineering is a high resistance for low power consumption, retention times in the orders of day or weeks. That's an interesting point, because in RAM application, you like to have a storage over years, 10 years, for example, in your memory stick, for new, uh, neuromorphic application, it might be not necessary because also your synaptic um, uh, memory changes with time. So it depends very much on the topology and the circuit, whether you do need weeks, days, or whatever. So it's not necessarily the case that you need a retention over, over uh, years or, or longer. Even days might be an interesting point. We like to have a continuous and analog switching, and of course, no electroforming in the beginning of the process. So the device should work from the beginning. So what we did, because we're coming from electron tunneling junction business, that's the structure layout. We used here a particular diobium aluminum double layer. I will explain that a bit more in detail in the next transparency. So this is a tunnel barrier, amorphous aluminum oxide. Then we put here a solid state electrolyte, but just like to emphasize this is 2.5 nanometers, this is around 1.3 nanometer, so it's a very thin layer, there. this double layer. And the top electrode is gold here, and uh, actually the platform here, up to that point, we borrowed intentionally from uh, low TC superconductors, and you see here this is an, is an established technology in low TC Josephson junction, you have niobium aluminum, as we, we are doing now. Then you have the aluminum oxide as an amorphous barrier, the top electrode. And when you cool down sus such a system, you get Josephson junction, and that means you have pure or nearly pure elastic tunneling. Otherwise, this curve will look totally different with a large subgap current. So that's an important point for later on when we do the model at room temperature that we can argue that our device definitely has a good tunnel barrier. That means most of the current is elastic. So that's the platform here. You see. That's an important step in that. And this is very important for the model layer. OK. Now how the device looks like in the IB characteristics, this is shown here. So indeed, what we found is we do not need any forming voltage. We have a set here. We have the reset here. We have very low current densities, what you see here. And also the voltage are reasonable. So what is the, what is the background of the device? How does it function? And uh, maybe I will tell that right now here. So the, the idea in the beginning was that you move, again, oxygen vacancies, and when you, or oxygen uh, ions, or metal ions, this is not absolutely clear which one, maybe both. And of course, because the tunneling current is very sensitive to the interface, and when you move oxygen there, then in principle you get a larger thickness, you get a different barrier height at that point, and this can change resistance of your device. This was the idea behind Interesting, when we measure now relatively large devices in dependency on the area, and this is a resistance times area product in the off and, uh, in the off and on a resistance state, you see that when you get the horizontal line, it's area independent 
function of the device. When you would get a filament somewhere here, and this is the geometrical area, and this is the filament area, you would get a line like that. This was a really clear indication of a filament device. So we can already prove that our device is, has a homogeneous switching effect from the interface, and that's an important part for, for our circuits, which we like to leave that. Um, from the point of physics behind, there are two possible mechanisms we figured out. One is, you have niobium oxide with different stoichiometry, you might fill traps and refill traps, and this change, of course, the, the, the complete current through the device. The other idea, actually this was the engineered idea in the beginning, that we move ions here, and of course this interface um, for the tunneling currents is very sensitive, the transfer um, function is very sensitive to this interface, and therefore by moving ions to the interface or uh, away from this interface, this would change resistance. But later on we figured out, of course, we have two interfaces, this one here, and the Schottky barrier on that side. And it came out later that we have both taken into account. It's very thin, no? it's, it's a layer of, of 2.5 nanometer, and when you move oxygen, you change the tunnel barrier, and as well you change the Schottky barrier. Both you have to take into account. Um, then we made different experiments, and indeed, this is with the, with the, um, with the tunnel barrier here, with the, with the niobium layer on top, this is with the Schottky barrier alone, but then when we have the Schottky barrier and the tunnel barrier alone, we get this kind of characteristics I've shown before. So we try to figure out what is most important in this kind of device. Um, the model behind is the following. We have an aluminum layer here at the end, we have the tunnel barrier here, and uh, the niobium oxide here, and when you switch from the low and high resistance state, you see how the bands are, are, are bending, and this in the model gives you an impact on the resistance of the device. This is shown here by an equivalent circuit model. This was done by, by, my, by Martin Siegler. And when you have here the simulations with an electronic equivalent circuit here, you can indeed mimic or simulate the experiment rather nicely, taking into account parameters which are realistic. This is always a good hint that the model has something to do with the reality. So it seems to be that on this level we understand our device quite well, and of course what we like to do is now to take this device and adapt it to pneumorphic circuits. What we do need, which kind of resistance, and so on. This is what we are trying to do. So the conclusion is we have a realization of a member stiff neuron circuit. We have uh, vanadium oxide that enables the all or nothing spiking in frequency uh, coding. A MEM capacitor emulates frequency adaptation like in the experiment of Adrian more than 90 years ago. And we have a homogeneous change in resistance in very thin films. This is the device I, I showed. And we have to take into account tunnel barrier properties and the Schottky barrier as well. And uh, the retention is tunable with the, with the barrier choice. What I like to emphasize is when you like to talk very deep ta in detail about, about these topics, maybe you know, these posters are still there, I'm not sure, <laughs> hopefully. So one is uh, Martin Siegler. He has a poster here with evaluation of neuromorphic uh, functionality using vinadium oxide. And kinetic mandrocolor simulation was done by Thomas Musenbrock. You can easily distinguish between both gentlemen, of course, they wear both glasses, but one is with hair, one is without hair. And there's another one. Accidentally, it's the, accidentally, it's the chairman today. And, and the chairman lives resistive switching. He lives that. Now, you see that here. This is a filament. At that time, the photo for this, for this publication here, he was in a low resistance state after electric forming. You see the filaments here. Today, today he is in a high resistance state. I believe so this is somewhat different. See that. Okay, I'd like to acknowledge uh, we have funding from German um, Research Society. We had, uh, half a year ago, we got a research group. Different uh, groups are included from ASIC development, from device development, simulations, and uh, also material science. And okay, this I'd like to acknowledge, and thank you for your attention.